All right, and welcome to those of you joining us on YouTube as well. On the TCF side of things, we want to thank Itasca Bank for sponsoring this webinar. Sponsors like Itasca Bank help us to keep these webinars free for everybody. Contact me for more information on sponsoring if you have a business that would like to sponsor some of our webinars. You can also help us to keep these webinars free. Afterwards, you're going to be taken to a page with a bunch of resources of things on our TCF website that you might be interested in, like our native plant guide, rain barrel information, and lots more, including our membership link. So if you're enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate. That helps TCF to continue to do all of the awesome stuff that we do because we do so much more than just webinars. Um, and when you become a member, you can enjoy the wide variety of members only stuff. For example, for our native plant sale that we just held last weekend, um, members got in to order a day early. So uh, lots of great benefits to being a member. I also want to thank those of you who participated in our Earth Day events. It was very successful and we appreciate all of you. As I mentioned, we do these webinars every week. Next week, I will be back to be talking about landscaping in shady areas. So if you've got that shady, uh, maybe shady and wet area where grass just doesn't grow or you, can, you know, can't get anything to grow there, uh, tune in because we'll be talking about some great native plants that you can put in areas like that. And on May 19th, we'll be talking about conservation of Illinois dragonflies. We'll be back to talk about more bugs. Um, we've got a great guest speaker who's gonna be sharing all this great information with us on Illinois dragonflies. All right, so that's all of the housekeeping that I have to do today. So now I am going to turn it over to our good friend, Carl Strang, who is knowledgeable of all things singing insects. Um, any of, if you've ever attended the Wild Things Conference in Chicago, you may have seen him um, and all of his great presentations. So I know that's where I first remember seeing you. We may have met before that, but um, I, I definitely remember seeing that presentation and just being so blown away by all the all the great information that you have about singing insects. So take it away, Carl. Okay, um, well, I'll start out with an apology. Apology, Jamie may need to do some hand holding here to uh, get me through the mechanics of this. Now, what are they seeing right now, Jamie? Are they seeing me? Seeing us. Yep. Oh, both of us. Okay, yep. equally. All right. Okay. So, um, my name's Carl Strang. I'll be doing this talk. I'll be shifting to a PowerPoint presentation in a little bit. But there were a couple of things that I wanted to uh, show you first as little demonstrations so that you'll know what you're hearing later on. And these are a couple of musical instruments that are analogous to what some of these singing insects are doing in their bodies to make the sounds. Uh, the first of these is this. Now this is just an unattached, whoops, are you still seeing me? It's okay. Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm going to go away so everybody can see it a little bit bigger. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll be right. in the background here just with my camera off. Okay, very good. Um, so this is an unattached drum head. Put it in a frame and it's just a regular drum head. But what this simulates is the cicadas sound producing structure, which is a membrane on the side of their body. And I will, at one point in the program, uh, be, do, be uh, playing a recording of this. If I shake it to vibrate it, it's gonna make that sound. So that you'll be hearing that later. And then the other one is another musical instrument. This one, you may not recognize it visually, but you've probably heard it before. It's often used in Latin um, music. Uh, it's called a guiro. And um, this is more analogous to what crickets and katydids do. And they vibrate their wings together to make their sounds. One wing has a file-like structure on it. You can see the ribs on this. Well, it's not a gourd. It's actually a, a piece of wood carved like a gourd. And then on the other wing, they have a hardened vein to, for, and this little stick would work like it. So they rub the two together and that's how they make the sound. 
but I wanted to show you that before I get into the PowerPoint so that you would be able to see those clearly. All right, so let's see. I'm not, not sure I'm remembering the sequence here. Um, do I have to hit share screen first or? Yeah, go ahead and share your screen. Okay, share screen. Oh yeah, here we go, all right. And then if I hit the PowerPoint and share, aha. Okay, so slideshow. Okay, all right. So you should be seeing my title slide. Are you seeing my title slide? Yeah, you're good to go. Okay, good. All right. So um, I call this Singing Insects 101. It's sort of an overview of the singing insects of uh, what I call the Chicago region, though um, some of you in more remote areas, even going as far as Ontario, um, uh, will uh, and West Virginia uh, will this will apply uh, at least in general to your areas as well. So, okay. So I want to start out by defining what I mean by singing insects. I'm going to trust that you all know what insects are. Um, so we'll go to the major groups of singing insects. I'm talking about species that have sound displays. I'm not talking about incidental buzzing, you know, that, that uh, a fly or a mosquito or a honeybee might be making as it's going along. These are actual displays that they're using for communication. In general, males making songs that females follow to find them. So four major groups. There are the crickets. Here's one example here, the katydids. Um, now with the crickets and katydids, again, that's where that guiro comes in. And um, so it's the that kind of sound. And I'll get into a little bit more detail on the difference between the cricket and katydid version of that sound, but that's basically how they're produced. Third group are the grasshoppers. Won't be getting into them very much. The grasshoppers tend not to display as much as the others. Um, some of them make their sound by flying and then rattling their wings. So it's a wing rattling kind of sound. And then there are others that stay perched. They keep their wings folded up like the one in the photograph, but then they rub their, they have special structures on their wing. They rub their legs against the folded wings to produce their sound. So those are the two ways that grasshoppers go. But again, they don't display as much as, as these others. So I won't be spending much time on them. And then the fourth group are the cicadas. And they're the ones that have the membrane on the side of their body, like the drum head that I demonstrated. All right, so there's that sound. But if you speed it up, Uh, keeping in mind that the cicadas have much tinier drum heads on their bodies than the big one I have. So what I did in that recording you just heard was I uh, vibrated the way I did it before I started this with the demo, but then I speeded it up. I took the recording and I sped it up and that simulated more, a more cicada-like buzzing sound. Now, uh, Tone versus buzz, uh, just to make some of these differences clear. Now here I've got photos of two different singing insects. On the left, the Cuban ground cricket, and on the right, a lyric cicada. And um, at the bottom below each picture is a graph showing their sounds visually. And I'll be playing the songs that produce these graphs in a little bit, but I want to explain, can you, you should be able to see my little white arrow here. And I'm pointing on the Cuban ground cricket graph to this little peak here. Crickets produce more of a tone. It's a more musical sound. And that's because they produce just one dominant loud frequency. So let me play the Cuban ground crickets song now.
So a single, uh, Jamie, were you able to hear that okay? Yep, sounded good. Okay, good. So what you were hearing was this single narrow sound. Um, the bottom here are the different frequencies of the sound. Like frequency is the highness or lowness of the sound. If I have a low voice like this versus a high voice like this, then the low voice would be at this end and the high voice would be more at this end. So that's that's the idea there. And um, on a, this is just the loudness of each high, high or low level, all right? So that's the, uh, the cricket. Uh, most of the crickets have graphs that will look similar to, the, to this in having just a single dominant uh, frequency. Now let's go to the lyric cicada. And you can see the graph looks a lot different. There are a lot, there's a broad range of high peaks here. And that's because a buzz, that's what a buzz is. It's a mix of a lot of different frequencies, some of which basically conflict with each other and produce a much less pleasant sound. So here comes the cicada. So, um, and I realized that um, I cannot see you to know, uh, as I said earlier, from your facial expressions, whether some of these things may not, that I'm saying may not make sense. By all means, use the, um, uh, you know, type in questions or, uh, and we'll get to them after my presentation. So if, if I say something that isn't entirely clear and you need a clarification, uh, by all means, take advantage of uh, the chat option. All right, let's go on. My study region is, is this 22 county area. Um, for those of you outside our region, um, here, this is Lake Michigan, this kind of big bul bulge here. And I've got three counties in Wisconsin, these three counties here. I did see someone is from Wisconsin out beyond those counties. Here's one county in Michigan, Berrien County, Michigan. And then here is the Indiana, Illinois border. So I've got most of my area is either in Illinois or in Indiana. And the reasons why it's a good idea to have an area that big, I'll, uh, that'll be made clear later on. All right, so rather than, I, I used to present this just as a bunch of, okay, here's this and here's its sound and here's another species and here's its sound. Uh, I've tried to liven this up by converting this presentation to an award format and basically tells the same story, but I hope in a more interesting way. So uh, our first award is for best appearance in a motion picture. So my best appearance, of course, I'm talking about the sound. And if you most of us watch movies, watch television shows, and we know that directors like to insert sound effects to help create a mood. And uh, there are several singing insects that are used in that way. The winner in this category is the snowy tree cricket. And here's a recording of its sound. Directors often insert this sound to convey a nice, calm, nighttime mood, no monsters around. We're just being nice and calm right now. So that nice rhythmic chirping, again, it's a cricket, so it's a basically a single dominant frequency there uh, for a pleasant sounding uh, ongoing chirp. All right, so let's go to our next award category. The most familiar species. And when I say familiar, I am again speaking about sounds. So these are things 
at least in the Chicago region that you probably have heard. And most of you from farther away probably have heard these as well. First, the fall field cricket. Um, and there is another species that will be starting up in our area within a month, the spring field cricket, which looks just like this one, sounds just like this one, but just has a different season. So let's listen to their chirps. And then the, the uh, winner in the katydid category is the common true katydid. This one, um, you're, only gonna, you're only likely to hear at night, except late in the season. Sometimes they'll go during the day, but this is a mainly a nocturnal insect. Again, this is a less pleasant, more buzzing sound um, with the Katie did, though the sound is produced in the same way by rubbing the two wings together with the structures uh, that we've talked about already. Um, this, one, this one you're unlikely to see, they're usually way up in the trees. All right, and then we have a uh, category winner in the cicada category, Glory. Linnae's cicada. So that one's more of a vibrato. We heard the lyric cicada before, that was more of a continuous buzz. This one is, is different in being more of a vibrato in its pattern. Let's move on, weediest species. Now here I'm, I'm being a little ecological on you. I am an ecologist and so I'm uh, doing this study from an ecologist's perspective. And uh, from a, in ecology, a weed is a plant or an animal that, uh, has a short lifespan, produces huge numbers of offspring that disperse widely. And certainly there are some singing insects that qualify as weedy species. The striped ground cricket would be the winner here among the crickets. This is one that you, if you have a lawn, you probably have these in your lawn. Uh, they're not super loud, but if, if you're listening, if you're paying attention, you'll hear them. And these are perhaps a hair less musical, those little uh, chirps are perhaps a hair less musical than are the sounds of many other crickets. Among the katydids, I don't have a recording for you of the short wing meadow katydid. These are extremely high pitched. Uh, I just uh, celebrated my 70th birthday. I haven't been able to hear these things for a long time now. Uh, as you get older, you lose the ability to hear high pitched sounds. I have ordered a bat detector that has a recording feature that can cut sounds down to a lower level so you can hear them and can record that. So I, I may be able to record one of these and insert it. But just to give you an idea of the pattern, in the middle katydids, they generally have a buzz and tick pattern. And with the short wing meadow katydid, uh, it, it is almost metronome-like. It's, it's short buzzes with evenly spaced ticks. So that that kind of uh, that kind of idea, only only much higher pitched. Um, kids can hear them. Grown-ups my age cannot. 
And then here we'll have a, uh, there are no cicadas that I would say are weedy. Uh, the weediest grasshopper, I'm awarding the Carolina grasshopper, that one. This one, if you spend much time outdoors, and I've seen these, I have seen these in Canada, so uh, I think these probably are pretty much where everybody, at least in the United, in the Eastern United States and Canada, will have encountered these. Um, they're fairly large grasshoppers. They're on the ground. When you pick them up and they fly, they have black wings with a cream colored edge. Uh, that's the Carolina grasshopper. So that's the winner of the weediest species there. When they display, they're one of the ones that rattle their wings in flight. Ah, now here's, here's where we test you folks in the audience. Think about this one for a minute. What do you think might be the singing insect that has the longest live life span? And uh, I th I'm sure that you all know this, but it may not come to mind uh, right away. Um, so when I hit, when I uh, move this along, you'll see a, a picture with two species and a recording with both of their sounds going at once. So these are the periodical cicadas. In the Chicago region, they have a 17-year lifespan, most of which they spend under the ground as a nymph. They're only out as adults at the uh, conclusion of their 17th year, uh, only out for two to four weeks uh, for mating and egg-laying purposes. Uh, two species. The one on the left, a little bit bigger, as you can see, that's the one that produced more of a tone um, in the recording. The one with more of a buzzing uh, sound is the one on the right, a little bit smaller. Uh, and they all come out at the same time. Every, every 17 years, there's an asterisk on that that I'm not going to take time to go into now. But some of you right around Chicago um, may have uh, been in an area where some of these came out last year, but the big emergence is going to be in 2024 in our area. Um, uh, this year, in a large part of Indiana, there are going to be, and other, uh, other spots, there are going to be a lot of these coming out uh, as well. All right, most on the move. Um, there are a number of species that, of singing insects and of other insects, um, that are shifting their ranges northward, probably because of climate change. And the one that's moving fastest, at least in my study region, is the jumping bush cricket. You look at the map here on the left, you can see a red line. That is where they were. That is as far north as they were in 1969. Since then, they've shifted basically half a state farther north. The map on the right is my map with locations where I have uh, made records of this uh, species. And I just added another county last year that I haven't added a dot. Uh, this is McHenry County, for those of you familiar with uh, Illinois, and uh, just found some in Algonquin at the uh, southern edge of McHenry County last year. So they're still moving north. Um, they're going at about a half, they, for a while they were going about a half a mile farther north each year. Uh, so they're moving along pretty quickly. And behind that front of advance, they become quickly become much more abundant. Um, and I'll play a recording. I kind of enjoy, kind of, I enjoy, <laughs> the uh, songs of these. They're, uh, they sing at night, and they, when you've got a bunch of them in the area, it sounds like they have, they're singing at different pitches. So listen for that in this recording.
All right, so that's the jumping bush cricket. And that's one you, you just don't see, they're very good at hiding. Um, so that's one you're much more likely to hear than you are to see. All right, but uh, as I mentioned, there's a bunch of species that were candidates for this award. Uh, and here are a few of them. Um, the Eastern Striped Cricket. Uh, now the, the maps, okay, you see, you see the photographs at the top, the names of these critters at the bottom, and then the top row of maps are basically the established ranges of these other than my study um, uh, from a very nice uh, website, the Singing Insects of North America website. Um, and then the bottom map is, uh, ma row of maps are my maps showing locations where I have found each species. Um, and again, these are, are expanding. The Eastern Striped Cricket, uh, you can see up until I started finding them that uh, they were mainly south and southwest of my study region. But I have been finding, they're not hugely abundant, but I have been finding them in a fairly large portion uh, of the southern part of my study region. And then the Cuban ground cricket, this is, this is really, uh, well, I don't know if it's a mystery, but um, this is one that was regarded strictly as a southern species. I'm drawing, kind of drawing the line of the range uh, where they were known. Now you see this little cluster of dots in Northeastern Illinois. I'm not the only kind of kooky person who does this kind of thing. Uh, I've got a friend in Cleveland, uh, Lisa Rainsong is her name. Uh, she's a music teacher, a uh, music professor. Um, so she's coming from a, at it from more of the sound end than from the biological end. But she found these Cuban ground crickets to be abundant in the counties surrounding Cleveland. And when um, uh, I learned of this from her, I started paying attention, thinking, well, maybe I'll find them where I am. And sure enough, a few years later, I found them um, near Kankakee. And I studied them, find out, found out how to distinguish their song, um, what they look like and all that. And lo and behold, I have found them in every single county <laughs> in my study region, where before they, at this longitude, they had only been known as far as north as Tennessee. So, uh, so if you want to talk about a jump north, uh, that's a pretty good sized jump north. And then um, the slightly musical conehead. Um, the cone heads are uh, katydids with cone-like projection, like I'm highlighting in the photo here, um, at the end of their uh, at the end of their head. And uh, this, this is one species, the slightly musical cone head, um, that ha again had been known as a southern species. Lisa has found them in a couple spots in Ohio, and here are the locations on my map of where I have found them in my study region, uh, only so far in the vicinity of the Moments wetlands in Kankakee County in Illinois. Uh, I've sought them in Will County, Southern Cook, haven't found them anywhere else in Illinois. Um, but they are fairly common, especially in the area that I'm sort of circling here um, in, in the map. Uh, and by the way, the Neocon Awards, if you were wondering if that odd name for the awards, that came from the genus for the cone-headed katydids. The, neo, the people who specialize in studying them call them the Neocons. So I thought, well, that's a kind of an interesting sounding name. So that's where the name for the award came from. Uh, and then uh, here's an honorable mention. I give it an honorable mention because it's not a native species and it's not spreading from the south. The Roysel's Katie did was introduced in the Montreal, Quebec area and has spread out from there over the years and um, has gone well beyond uh, our region. Um, I have found it in, again, in every county in my study area. Uh, okay, now this one, I do have a recording. Uh, I have a harder time hearing these every year. So they have a fairly high pitched continuous buzz uh, depending on your own age, you may or may not be able to hear this recording clearly.
they will be, they're fairly early season species. Uh, they'll be starting to sing before the end of June. Okay, farthest out on a limb, another award category. This one is for the, the species that are in our region at least, most threatened by climate change. And the award for that one goes to the sphagnum ground cricket. Uh, these are very abundant in the north, but as far south as we are, they are limited to the sphagnum bogs, which are just a few scattered locations. And um, sphagnum bogs are very likely to be drying up and going away uh, as the climate warms. So that's why this is the winner. I think I've got a recording. Yeah. So I hope you're beginning to get a sense of the diversity uh, of these of these critters. Uh, they're not one big lump of a group. They occur in a whole variety of habitats. In my region, I may not have said there are about a hundred species altogether of uh, singing insects. Um, from an ecological standpoint, the most interesting group are the ground crickets. Um, interesting because there. Um, you often will find more than one species um, in one in the same place, uh, overlapping in their habitats. And this is, uh, if you go back to elementary school and remember what Venn diagrams are, this is kind of a Venn diagram of habitats uh, overlaps for these various species. So all of these are names. If you just add ground cricket to the name in the in each circle, that'll give you. Um, um, they're, they're a complete common name. Uh, some of these are more dry soil species, others more wet soil species. And we've got an extreme here with the sphagnum ground cricket. Uh, some are more grasslands, others are more woodland species. Uh, and often you find maybe just two together, but sometimes as many as four all together in the same place. And um, how is it that they can coexist? That's what makes them interesting ecologically. Uh, the apparent answer for, for what it's worth is that their numbers are kept low enough by predators, parasites, and so forth, that they don't become abundant enough to compete. So they can coexist even though they are ground crickets, they're doing much the same thing, uh, but their numbers are kept low enough that they're not in a position of, uh, of competing. At least that's our best guess to this point. What's the most threatened group? Now here we get into conservation and I am a member of the Conservation Foundation myself. So I'm, uh, uh, conservation concerns, uh, I share those. Uh, what is the most threatened group of singing insects? I would say that these are the wetland katydids. And here are some examples. Um, all of these live in, in marshes or, um, or at least in wetland situations. The four with the photographs are ones that I have found in the region. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit of detail on some of these. There are two species that historically were here that I have not found, and I'm, as far as I can tell, they have, are now extinct in the region. Uh, not extinct globally, but extinct in our region. Uh, here, like I said, a little more detail. One of the ones that seems to be extinct in our region is the slender conehead. Um, now on these maps, the open circles represent counties where they used to be, there were records or specimens. This photograph is of a specimen of this uh, cone-headed katydid collected at Illinois Beach State Park, which is right about here in Lake County, Illinois. Um, can't find them. I've looked, I've looked hard and I cannot find them. Uh, I think they're gone from our region. 
the striped face meadow katydid, did look at all the conies where they once were known and i've you know again i've looked and looked and looked i've only found them in one place and again illinois beach state park a lot if you're familiar with that park the dead river uh area and also in the swales the introduced swales there uh, have uh, really a nice population of striped face meadow katydids, which are beautiful little critters um, but uh that's pretty much it. That's where they are. Um, the nimble meadow katydid, this, I'll, I'll get into a little more detail on this one later. Um, only have found it in a very few places. Um, as you can see, the black dots are where I have found them. And then open circles are counties where they once were known. Uh, I've gone to the lakes where they once were known, and they're just not there anymore. What's the reason that uh, these critters are threatened? And if you're familiar with conservation issues and restoration work, uh, this will be a familiar story. Uh, invasive plants that these insects cannot live in are coming in and displacing the native marsh vegetation. Uh, one of these is the purple loosestrife. Reed canary grass is a huge problem in our area. Common reed, the Phragmites is another one. And then the hybrid cattails. These are very difficult, almost intractable restoration problems. They invade, this, they displace the native wetland grasses and other plants. And so far, unless somebody's come up with something I haven't heard about yet, the only solution is once they've completely taken over a marsh is you uh, herbicide the whole thing, kill everything basically, and uh, start over. And uh, uh, you just don't find the singing insects on these plants. They cannot live on them. So for the species that I have been finding, it's only been in places where the na native uh, wetland grasses and other wetland species uh, still occur. Most intriguing species. I said I would come back to this one. It's the nimble meadow katydid, and that's because this one lives only in um, emergent wetland vegetation in, in deep water. Water's got to be at least knee deep, and uh, there are only like three kinds of plants that this thing will live on, um, and if you think back to the map I showed, I've only found it in, in like five places. There may be a couple more. I, I have to search for these things in my kayak. So this isn't something you're going to do from the shore. You have to go out into the water uh, to try to find them. I believe I have a recording. So this is a meadow Katie did that has only the buzz and no ticks. Um, and again, has this peculiar habitat limitation. Best name. Well, this is a very subjective category. Uh, I awarded this one to the slightly musical conehead, where we had one that we had met before. Um, the person who first named it called it the slightly musical conehead because he thought that they were that their song was just very faint. But he later, later changed his tune and in a later writing said, well, okay, yeah, I can hear him quite well. Uh, let me play a recording here. This one has spaced buzzes. If you saw the film, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? This, this critter reminds me of that movie because there's a scene in Who Framed Roger Rabbit where the bad guy is trying to find Roger Rabbit, uh, a cartoon character. And what he does is he does the shave and a haircut, which is, uh, I'm going to do this on my desk. We'll see. I hope you can hear this. Can you hear that knocking? 
So he goes around doing this and the, it's an old uh, uh, sort of call and response thing, shaving a haircut and then the response is two bits. So the whole thing would be shave and a haircut two bits. And Roger Rabbit cannot avoid, cannot resist the temptation to finish it. So the bad guy is doing that and he expects Roger Rabbit to reveal himself with the two bits. And so he does uh, and things proceed from there. The reason these guys remind me of that is that you find a bunch of them in a marsh and they all have to sing in unison. You heard that buzzing sound. Um, whoops, whoops, whoops. It's not letting me go backwards. Let me try, yeah, here. So you hear the space buzzing. They're all doing that in unison. And if you go in there and you're close to one and he's disturbed and he stops because you're there, he just, he just can't stop. Even though you're right there, he has to start up again so that he's singing with all the others. And it's, I don't know, maybe I'm perverse. I find that amusing. All right. Some other lessons from this study. Habitat. Some are associated only with sand soils. Um, this is true of some of the cicadas. Their nymphs live in the soil. So some of them really need the sandy soils for their babies to live in. Some of the grasshoppers are sand soil species because they lay their eggs in the soil and so soil texture is important to them. Uh, and this also includes some that are even more restricted to beach and dune areas, the gray ground cricket, uh, for instance, and the seaside grasshopper. If you look at all the photographs surrounding the seaside grasshopper map, you'll see that this particular kind of singing insect varies quite a bit in its coloration according to the background that it lives in. So this one here that I'm highlighting with my little white arrow, the middle one on the middle photo on the right, that's from the Indiana Dunes area where the sand along the beach is a nice uniform quartzy sand. If we go to the lower right hand corner critter, this is from Illinois, the beach at Illinois Beach State Park which is a much more diverse mix of um, small particles of other kinds of rock. And so the color pattern is different and the insects have been selected, of course, uh, by the predators uh, to the point where they resemble that background. These are all the same species, but they match in coloration the background habitat where they live. Um, in some cases, the species achieve their range limits in my study area. Uh, Longspurred meadow katydid, did pretty much the same uh, range now that they had in the early 1900s. So not every species is expanding with climate change. Some are pretty stable. Uh, the Nebraska Conehead, again, a uh, fairly stable range limit. Now, there had been an old record from McHenry County, and I looked and looked for them. It took a while to find them, the, but there are some in the uh, uh, here where this dot is. That is the Chain of Lakes State Park, and I have found them in both the Lake County side and the McHenry County side of that uh, state park. But that's the only place farther north where I have run across Nebraska coneheads. Uh, swamp cicada, uh, this one's a bit of a puzzle. It's mainly an Eastern species, but I have found them all along the Kankakee River. That's what I'm tracing here. So I found them in several counties along the Kankakee River. And then there's a gap, which is most of Will County. And then they become abundant again in this area, centering in DuPage County and then some surrounding areas, uh, including, uh, now this dot here in Northern Will County, that's Knock Knolls Park, which uh, if you are familiar with the Conservation Foundation, this is just down the street from the Conservation Foundation's headquarters. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if swamp cicadas have flown onto the farm property there uh, from time to time. Um, 
But this is what would be called a, a disjunct grouping or population um, uh, of, of the swamp cicada. So kind of an odd, interesting uh, situation with them. I mentioned earlier that there, it's valuable to have a large study area, north to south and east to west. The north to south, I've touched on that somewhat with the climate change and the, the range boundaries and range expansions. East to west, uh, where we are here, provides a gradient from western prairie to eastern forest habitats. And so we have some, some prairie specialists, and here are some examples um, in the western part of our uh, region. The prairie meadow Katie did, actually I have only found it in savannas. So um, um, over time, we'll see. Uh, but uh, that one may be more, <laughs> at least in our area, better named the savannah meadow Katie did. Uh, prairie cicada, these are little guys, um, about an inch long that, uh, Again, just a few remnant prairies. You don't find these in, they don't disperse really at all. So you're not going to find these in restored prairies unless perhaps someone tries putting them there. And that experiment remains to be done. We'll see if anybody decides to try that. Um, so, and I've only found the, sh the short wing toothpick grasshopper in the uh, Kankakee Sands area of Kankakee County. Uh, though historically they were known from a couple other spots. I haven't found them any anywhere else so far. Um, distributional lacunae, that's, well, that's maybe a little uh, odd way of putting it. It means that there seem to be holes in the distribution of these things. Uh, and the, uh, an example here is the oblong winged Katy did. There are two counties where I haven't found them at all, where they historically were known. I expect to find them eventually, but, but they're scarce there. Uh, so far, no good. So lots of little mysteries to uh, intrigue the scientist. Some species are not very well known. Melodious ground cricket was described, oh, in the late 1900s. Um, it seems to, it was described as a, generally as a wetland species. I have found it only in floodplain bottomland forests around dead rotting wood on the ground. Um, uh, so I've been able to refine understanding of this one a little bit. Um, and because these things are well hidden, sometimes I have to go just by the song and I need to be able to distinguish that the song to identify and um, document the presence of that species. So here is a graph. And if you're graph averse, I apologize. But what this does is um, provide the highness or lowness of the sound. Again, the frequency. Kilohertz is just the... Uh, one kilohertz means 1,000 vibrations of the wing per second, uh, or 1,000 1, pulses per, per second. So 4,000, 5,000, uh, uh, or no, no, I'm sorry, uh, vibrations of sound, the sound frequency, the highness or lowness uh, is that. And then the pulses are the number of vibrations of the wings per second. And so you, you measure these in a computer, you graph them out, and the melodious ground cricket, the one that uh, I just mentioned that loves the rotting wood, uh, their songs fall out, fall out here. And then I've got a couple other species here for contrast. The most important one, because you find it in the same habitat sometimes as the melodious ground cricket is, well, the scientific name is this, it's Say's Trig another little cricket. And uh, so you can see that it is possible to separate them out by analysis in the computer. Though the sound quality is enough that with practice, you can distinguish the two fairly, fairly easily just by ear. Now, pulse, I mentioned pulse rate, the number of vibrations of the wing per second. So here's how I do that, how I measure that to produce the graph. 
and here is a graph uh, example. The left-hand part just so it shows the raw recording. And then in the computer program, I can slow it down or spread it out to see each individual pulse. So I'm gonna play a recording of what you're seeing here on this graph. So it'll start out with the regular melodious ground cricket song, and I hope you find it melodious, I think it is. Um, but then when it's slowed down, you will actually hear the separate individual pulses uh, that make it up. And because I've slowed it down, the pitch, the frequency will go down. So I can select a two second, say, uh, span of the original recording uh, and then spread it out far enough to see the individual pulses, count them up, and that gives me the number of pulses uh, per second. Another little known species, the variegated ground cricket. This is a close relative of the Cuban ground cricket, which I uh, showed you earlier. These two little crickets have very similar songs. And again, just to, uh, to be sure, I have to graph them out. And uh, you can see here, there are two clusters of graph points here. Um, variegated ground crickets fall out here. Cuban ground crickets fall out here. Okay, well, we're getting down toward the end now. Um, we've talked, I've already talked to hit on one way in which things have changed over time. With climate change, we're seeing range changes of some of these species. Uh, habitats also can change over time. I wanted to see if seaside grasshoppers occurred in Racine County, Wisconsin. So I went into Google Earth and the satellite photo showed this nice little line of dunes along the edge of Lake Michigan in uh, northern, uh, at this cliffside park in northern Racine County. So I went there hoping to find them. And Lake Michigan's water level had risen to the point where it had washed out the dunes and uh, the grasshoppers were gone. The only place where seaside grasshoppers now occur in Racine County is in uh, a Reese, Racine City Park where there are, is a little area of dunes that still exists. So things change. And what I'm finding today is much different than what was the, true in the early 1900s. And so now I'm gonna finish with just some scenes that I think are just magnificently beautiful. Uh, some of my favorite spots in my study region. Uh, here you're looking at Primeval Illinois, basically. This is the, uh, a portion of the Kankakee Sands area in eastern Kankakee County, Illinois. A black oak savanna, a true savanna that still has surviving. It's a nature conservancy site. The nature conservancy is doing an excellent uh, job of managing it. And it's just, just beautiful. When I go here, I feel like I've jumped back 200 years. And if you did jump back 200 years, you'd pretty much be seeing the same thing. Another beautiful spot, beautiful area is the uh, Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore area and Indiana Dunes State Park area. Uh, here's an inner dune swale there. Some remnant prairies. Uh, this is a magnificent portion of a little uh, state nature preserve in uh, near Gary, of all places, uh, Indiana. And then back to Illinois, uh, back to Indiana Dunes National Park. Uh, 
And if you're wondering why I'm saying national park, it was changed a few years ago from national lakeshore to national park. Um, this is at Miller Woods uh, in uh, Lake County, Indiana. So organizations like uh, our host today, the Conservation Foundation, the Nature Conservancy, National Park System, Forest Preserves and other county and local parks are hugely important in preserving habitats because I do a lot of driving between sites like this because the agricultural and urban uh, areas um, really are wastelands as far as most of these species are concerned. And it's critically important uh, that uh, areas be preserved so that these species can go on. Uh, just a closing slide. Um, I, do every, I do have a guide to the singing insects of uh, the Chicago region with the, with the 100 species or so. I, I update this each year with the new data from uh, the past year's field work. And I send it out for free. It's a condensed about five meg a PDF document that I send out for free. If you want to uh, send me an email and ask to be put on the list, I, I, you know, I'll send you the latest edition and uh, put you on the mailing list for that. I have a blog. Um, I don't add to it as much as I once did, but I do uh, have a, a few entries every year in which I uh, provide uh, some new information. Uh, those of you in, uh, Cook County, uh, if there are any, I, I didn't, didn't see the whole list of people signed up today. Uh, if you're interested in studying uh, these insects and becoming a monitor, uh, Kathleen Solar started this. Uh, Nagin Almasi is a staff member of the Cook County Forest Preserve District, and uh, they together are uh, uh, governing a singing insects monitoring program. So um, that is that. And let's see. OK, so now let's see. I know we didn't talk about how I get out of this. Uh, <laughs> and show. You should just hear up at the top. Uh, I got gotcha. you. OK, all right. So, uh, all right. so we're back. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, real quick, we have a couple of questions here, and, and one in particular I'm actually super intrigued about. Um, so there was a question that says, can you touch on how insects likely experience their singing differently than we hear them? And are there any oddities that really stand out in this regard? Okay, all right. Um, yeah, let's get into... Uh... Uh, into, I've talked about the sound production. I haven't said anything about sound reception. Uh, I don't have, uh, I don't want to take the time to try to dig out a photo, but um, you cannot, it doesn't work to try to picture a singing insect with ears on the side of their head. That doesn't work. That's not where their ears are. Their ears, believe it or not, are on their front legs. And if you think about it, it, it does make sense. Having two ears is important for us to know where a sound is coming from. We use the difference in volume between our two ears to kind of, you know, we can turn toward a sound and that helps us to locate uh, where the sound source is. Insects are tiny. And if they're to have the maximum separation between their two ears to give them the best chance of locating the sound, it's better to have them on their legs because they can spread their legs out to the side to keep those ears farther, uh, more widely separated. Um, and that makes, that makes locating the sound uh, more easy. Uh, I mentioned that the females generally are following the song to find the males. Uh, some of these males are territorial, so they're hearing, they're interested in hearing other males as well, uh, so they can defend their turf. Um, 
Now, as far as the experience, well, we can only really guess what the experience of the insect is like. But uh, one thing we do know is that with insect perception, it tends in some ways to be more limited than, than ours. Um, I mentioned how some of these songs in closer related species to our ears sound identical but they have different pulse rates, they have slightly different frequencies. And so one thing that these insects are doing is they are discriminating. Uh, the, female, the females are only responding to the higher, say the higher or lower pulse rate of their own species. Um, so that's, that's one critical factor there. Um, with, uh, with some insects, if I go outside the singing insects for a moment um, and think about moths, moths can only hear, re and this is, this is not true of every moth, but, but in some cases, the moths can only hear really high frequency sounds. And if they can hear anything, that means it's bad news because high, really high frequency sounds are bat cries and bats like to eat moths. So if a moth's flying around in, a, in its own quiet little world and suddenly it starts hearing something, uh-oh, that's trouble. Uh, so that would be an example of uh, a way in which an insect's sensory perception would be different from ours. Uh, you think that answers that adequately? Yeah, I know, that's, that's great. I was wondering, you played a clip that had this, it was multiples of the same species and they were different pitches. Yes. Does, is that like male versus females or do only the males sing or different sizes? What causes those different pitches? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, that was the jumping bush cricket. Um, they're singing, usually their song perches are on the trunks of trees in crevices in the bark, or uh, they like to hang out uh, buried in vines growing up on, on the trunks of trees. Um, I can make a couple of educated guesses. I don't know for absolute sure for that one. But one thing that we do know is that at different, that temperature makes a difference. Uh, as the temperature warms up, uh, insect activities uh, speed up in general, and that can, that can include wing vibration speed. And as that speeds up, then this, the pitch of the sound, the highness or lowness, it gets higher and higher. So the warmer it, warmer it is, the higher it is. So one possibility is that the different males, and it is only the males producing these songs, the different males are in places with slightly different temperature, and maybe their vibrations are more sensitive than other species to very slight differences in temperature. That's one possibility. Another possibility, and I think you suggested this, is size. Um, a bigger wing is more likely to produce a lower sound. A smaller wing can vibrate more quickly with the same effort, possibly and may produce a higher sound. So these are possibilities, but I'm really just speculating here, but we, uh, but we do see things like that uh, happening with, uh, with these critters. Interesting. Uh, our friend Terrence from Louisiana wants to know, we have something called a devil's horse. Do they sing? Are you familiar with that one? Oh boy, uh, sorry, uh, that's not a name I've run across. Um, I will say, that you go south, especially that far south, or if you go west into the western uh, United States, um, you get, get into a lot more species. I mentioned 100 species in my 22 counties. Uh, the same size area, say in Louisiana, uh, is going to have a lot more species than that. Uh, and some of them will be the same, uh, but a lot, but of course, a lot of them are going to be completely different, uh, and I'm I have to apologize. That's that one I've never heard of. He actually clarified and and said um, it's also called the lubber grasshopper. Oh, okay, okay, those yeah. we have here too. 
Okay, yeah, yeah, lover grass, there are, yeah, I didn't elaborate on the grasshoppers much. In our area, there are three subfamilies of grasshoppers that are singing insects. Uh, that qualify as singing insects because they produce these sound displays as I described. Many other kinds of grasshoppers don't do that. And the lubber grasshoppers don't, are not singers. So, um, uh, and in fact, uh, even in our area, you go wading through a, a meadow or whatever, most of the grasshoppers you kick up are not singers. They belong to a subfamily called the spur-throated spur grasshoppers that, that are not singers. So it is very uh, 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 specific and uh, uh, many grasshoppers do not sing in this way. Okay. Annette wants to know, does the singing or the songs use up a lot of energy causing them to have to eat more? Well, you'd think it would have to because so many of them just sing day or night and just go on and on and on. Um, it's possible that someone has measured that since my focus is more ecological, uh, I have to apologize to whoever, whoever has done that kind of research because I haven't uh, looked into that. Um, Something tangential to that, though, is that there are costs, in addition to the energy production, there are other costs. When a male is singing, more than just females of his species can hear that. And there are parasitic insects that are specialized on these species, and they actually follow the sounds of the males and lay their eggs on them and the males uh, suffer a lot higher mortality than the females for that reason. Uh, there's a whole family of flies, uh, for instance, that, that do this. Um, and sometimes you can see if you, sometimes I've caught uh, singing insects, uh, the conehead, this happens to the coneheads, for instance, uh, where you can actually see the eggs uh, uh, on them or that have been recently laid uh, by these parasites. Um, and, uh, oh, I mean, we're talking about 30 to 40% of males in, in some cases that have been studied uh, uh, never get to sing because, uh, or don't get to sing for long because they're immediately taken out by these parasites. So, that, so, so I, you know, I'm kind of going around the question of uh, the energy cost of singing, but to point out another way in which the singing does have significant costs. That's interesting. I, w I would not have thought of parasites, you know, things like frogs or birds or, you know, something else being able to hone in on the song. Sure. But I wouldn't, I, I would not have occurred to me that there would be parasites that would do that as well. That's really interesting. Well, I think one, most of the, there are some species that sing pretty much through 24 hours. There are some that'll sing through the day Many of them only sing at night, and it wouldn't surprise me if the reason for that is uh, birds. Yeah, absolutely. That would make sense. All right. Well, thank you so much for this. This has been absolutely fascinating. I love all the new information I get to learn when I do these webinars. So um, lots of thank yous in the chat as well. So um, we really appreciate you coming out and joining us today, Carl. It's been an absolute pleasure. This webinar, as I mentioned, is recorded, so it will be up on our YouTube site later today. So if you have a friend who missed it and wanted to check it out, definitely let them know. So thank you again, and thank you all for joining us today. I hope you all learned a lot as well. Take yeah. care, everybody. Goodbye.